Sorry about the little bit of a missing clip, but this is the first week that I'm in my new apartment, and so things are a little bit quieter here. Uh, I have still the ability to pull audio out, uh, and a couple of different ways to do it, and I'm just still kind of experimenting what works the best. And unfortunately, neither of the two people who were maybes on the invite for this show are going to show up, so we are going to, as usual, have something to listen to and maybe a couple of things to talk about, but I want to get into the, the media first. Uh, and this one is by an old friend, Tigre. This is uh, called Cycle. I'm going to see if I can get it queued up here. Uh, unfortunately, I have to stop the recording <laughs> and then queue up the song and then continue the song and then start the recording up again just the way things are set up here. Hopefully in the upcoming weeks I'll have access to a little bit more complicated setup that will allow me to do this sort of thing in real time like I was able to do before, but just bear with me here. Chillin's the bottom, but constant, you push it on It's kinda wild, I guess this thing has gotten you While you was striving through something was driving you Provide you with strength until you make it through And it won't respond like you just begun You in this brand new atmosphere, but damn you is the only one And it's all peace, you know you need some time to get in the zone Give yourself a chance to gather your thoughts, feelings, and chromosomes A lot of shit happens now, you growing and maturing Preparing yourself for new things Soon got to endure and I'm sure it gets scary, I know it Where you gon' go or who you gon' be? You tryna gather the spot you in the face, moms and daddy So sadly you want to leave All these brand new ones up that grind Cold and wait and run this fade to bring you some cover And then you discover it's just ain't feeling that it's suddenly for your bed You just have that push for a goal But you really ain't aware this is safe driving I'm gonna be more than other cats behind me But that was something you do more than move forward Learn, grow and climb So when again you ain't ready to time But there's no rush to finish first Maybe because you're scared of being alone with you need this life on earth But man, look, you won, you left all the other cats behind Keeping your body, you're keeping your spirit in your mind I guess in time I'll find out 
And those birds are singing Those birds are singing second song there was Everything is Automatic, a cover by Porn on Beta. I just threw that in because, as I mentioned in one of the previous videos, anytime the guests don't show up, we get two songs. So hopefully that's not too much of incentive for nobody to show up. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's like the, the whole secret here is that people just want to hear more music. Uh, but realistically, though, uh, that was, I guess, put on the webpage of Porno Beta, uh, which is part of the, I guess, rap media network so many years ago. Uh, but that, that at least is, is, is kind of something. It, it's weird uh, playing them because I don't actually get to hear them now. I only get to see the, the time go, go by. It's like completely dead silent here, uh, which is a little unnerving sometimes. But so what, what has been going on this week? Well, as, as kind of mentioned, I'm in a new apartment. So it took a good day of sorting, and I'm still not like fully sorted in here, but I am slowly getting to the point where I can like all I know where all my things are, and I'm not losing things. Like I lost my MP3 player this past couple of days, found it again, hooray! It's it's still here, and uh, there, there's a couple things that need to be kind of cleaned and organized yet, but it's it's starting to get into the the point of things that. That, that just need to be organized regularly anyway, rather than literally unpacking everything I own and putting it in a place. And so there, that was going on. And then in addition to that, there was the process of finding work, which I now apparently have, or at least I'm, I'm very close to it. I haven't, I haven't signed any paperwork yet, so everything's still kind of like verbal, or at least email back and forth, yes, you have the job sort of thing. But from here on in, I'm going to be helping with the campaign of the local member of parliament in West Side, uh, Saskatoon. I don't, I don't know. I should actually dig it up uh, now that I'm thinking of it, whether it's still Saskatoon Rose Town Bigger. I think it's called something else now since uh, Stephen Harper changed the writings around. Uh, but it's, it's not all that important. The important part I want to get into here is just that I cannot be considered totally independent anymore since I am going to be pulling a paycheck not from the New Democrat Party, but from one of the members of Parliament for the New Democrat Party. So that is going to be a conflict of interest on my part. But at the same time, this show and anything else I share on social media is definitely going to have nothing whatsoever to do with that. So if I say something, it in no way, shape, or form implicates a Sherry Benson, who probably a lot more, how, how shall I put it, grounded in reality. <laughs> than, than I am. So she is, uh, as, as, you know, she, she's the, the member of Parliament, has been serving the community here, but I, I don't want to really get into that on this show so much. Uh, but just so you out there know, if you don't want to believe me because I have this conflict of interest, that's okay. It's, it's a realistic thing to not believe someone on certain topics when they have such a vested interest in a particular side in or, or a particular issue. And if you look back in my history of videos and audio and writing, uh, you will see that a lot of the things that I talk about are, are very parallel to what the NDP and in particular Sherry Benson is pushing. And so there isn't really much of a change on my part 
as far as that is concerned. But you could still accuse me of a conflict of interest here, and that's totally valid. So, okay, so now that that kind of disclaimer is out of the way, <laughs> what else is going on this week? One of the, the kind of comments that came up uh, before I moved out, or kind of like in the process of while I was moving out, was that Justin Trudeau, as the Prime Minister, has done both good and bad things. He's done things like legalized pot. Legalizing pot is a good thing, I think. Saves a lot of effort on the part of the federal government from arresting and throwing away people for, on, on the face of it, smoking pot. But underlying that is probably, or all, almost certainly, uh, racial, economic, and other issues that they can't arrest people for. But if they can arrest you for having a joint on you, they would do that. And so without that as the excuse, either A, they have to find another excuse, which maybe the, the regulations surrounding pot, maybe smoking pot in a public place, that sort of thing, they're still valid. And ways of uh, arresting people for nonsense reasons, even without the terrorist reasons. Um, but the it, it's harder, and the, the law is a lot more sensible now than it used to be, even five, ten years ago on that side. Uh, and there are other uh, good things that he has done. Like instituting a carbon tax is a, a really good thing, um, regardless of how imperfect the, the current uh, proposals are. Uh, just the, the fact that he's put it on the provinces to negotiate their own price uh, and that they've given it the, the provinces that option, I think it's a smart way of doing it. And he, he does deserve some credit for things like that. And then the, the side part of the comment was, but, and even though he's done things that are not so good, he hasn't done anything that's really stupid and that's really bad for the country. And I would, of course, disagree with that. I think that the anti-terror acts alone, even before he was elected, is in that category. And so there's, there's that to consider. But I want to hear, I want to get some feedback on If you're listening to this right now and you can think of something that is really harmful to the not, not like a little minor bad thing, not something that you just merely disagree with or that some economic or tax policy that you know, maybe things could be better on some other party, but like something that's really damaged the long-term interest of Canada in a serious way. Send me an email, uh, jeffrey.cliff at gmail.com or uh, ricochet at uh, ricochet colon ms z i s n for Neptune, a f for Foxtrot, 7 b for Victor, q q p for Penguin, h for hotel, R for Romeo, D for Delta. I, I haven't been reading that off uh, the past couple of episodes, but I've noticed, though, that if you don't know who I am, and if you're just listening to this on some radio station, which this could very well be broadcast on a radio station by this point, you may not know how to get in touch with me. So it's, it's kind of hard to, to balance how reading a ricochet address of, like that is, is kind of a hard thing to do. I mean, with Newsreel, uh, Sean Kennedy had info at rantradio.com or newsreel at rantradio.com. It was really something simple that you could just send an email to. What, I mean, I guess jeffrey.clip at Gmail is not that far from it, but uh, it'd be nice to have something simple like that to give out to people so that they could get a little bit of feedback to me. But anyway, long story short, if you have some ideas of what you think Justin Trudeau has done, that is just utterly terrible. Send it to me because election season is coming and we've got to compare notes a little bit here. And I have some ideas of what I would consider to be these things. Things like the Anti-Terror Act, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the new version of it. Things like that. Changing our refugee policy to give the Trump administration veto over who can get in and who can't get into Canada's immigration. That that alone, I think, is, is a colossally stupid thing to do. Giving Trump any authority whatsoever in Canada isn't just bad policy, but it's stupid policy because we really don't have to do this. And if you go from city to city in Canada, yes, there are some people who support Trump, but by and large, he's detested. Like, <laughs> it's, it's unlike even George Bush didn't get the amount of just abject hatred that so many Canadians feel. For this man and so putting him as the head of the executive branch in charge of any aspect of canadian policy whatsoever is one unnecessary if we want to continue to be a sovereign nation and two it just flies in the face of the democratic will and so i would consider that a really stupid thing uh, that he has done and 
there is there are other things, but I want to hear them from you. So if you are listening, send it to me. Post it in this thread that you see this video posted. I really would like more feedback on this show, so please give me some. In the meanwhile, on the topic of minor stupid things that he has done, uh, I was reading when I first got to Saskatoon, The Star Phoenix, and I, w I, I think I still have a copy of it, but it's it's just not totally at hand at the moment. But one of the articles in it was talking about how uh, since <laughs> Trudeau kowtowed to the U.S. extradition request for, I think it was the CEO or one of the high executives of Huawei, and then China has barred imports of things like canola and some of our other agricultural products. There's a mad scramble going on on the side of the federal government to find new markets for this product, for to find new countries other than China that are willing to soak things like our excess canola that would have gone to China. And so they're going to places like the Philippines and Indonesia and other East Asian countries trying to find buyers for this, this product. And there's two things on that side. I know there is some, like, for example, there used to be the, the, the wheat board used to be owned uh, locally here in Canada. And it made sense for the wheat board to do that kind of marketing because it was, I mean, it's almost similar to a crown corporation, right? You had some organization that was specialized in marketing and controlling the quality and all, all that sort of thing. I don't know for canola and other products which whether they have a, something similar set up. As I understand, they don't, but I'm not sure. But the way that the article in the Star Phoenix was talking about it, it was talking about it as if it was just the, the trade minister and the j just members of the Trudeau government generally who were tasked with going out and doing this marketing for the producers, uh, going out doing this marketing for the farmers, going out and, and contacting possible buyers and doing all this footwork in East Asia to try to sell this product. Now, on one hand, it kind of makes some sense on a national level that if the Trudeau government has screwed over farmers, that they should go and take a little bit of effort to try to make things better for them which th that, there's something to be said for that. But on the other hand, this is a substantial amount of effort being put forward to market the end product of one class of business or one class of producer of goods in Canada. And they're basically getting free marketing budget funded by the taxpayer. So what exactly entitles them to that? Is it the fact that they're just farmers and in particular, the Liberal government wants to appeal to farmers in the upcoming election because they're losing in those areas to the Conservatives and possibly the People's Party. Uh, is it the, the just the sheer amount of votes that those farmers are going to bring in that they can whiplash the government to do their bidding in this way? I mean, it would be nice if this kind of service was available to other sectors. I, I can think of a couple of small bands who might be able to use, for example, uh, a couple million dollars in marketing <laughs> research and effort in East Asia uh, on their behalf. Would the benefits be as large? Hard to say. But it, it, it was not even commented on in the newspaper. It was just sort of a, a, a oh, of course we're going to fund farmers and their marketing efforts with taxpayer dollars. Of course we're going to do that even though the budget is in balance, and even though there's no even pretense that the budget will be balanced, and even though there's like a half trillion dollar debt uh, waiting to be paid, uh, we want to just ignore all that and pick up some canola farmers and <laughs> spend some federal tax dollars on keeping them happy. And what does this also do to the markets in Eastern Asia? Like, what? Do the <laughs> canola farmers elsewhere in the world have this to, to rely on? And how much is this going to to unbalance that situation? I mean, I'm sure there are other places in the world with, like the EU probably, if, if it grows canola anywhere, uh, probably funds marketing for it. But it, it's just a bad cycle to get into. And again, the paper really didn't mention this aspect of this, this story. So it's, it's worth mentioning it to have someone talk about it. So there's that. Another thing that has come up recently is I went to 
a presentation by Environment North when I was still in Thunder Bay. And I've told a couple of you about this, so it may be a little bit of a review. But I was originally invited, and it was funny the way they invited me, uh, which was that they sent me an email saying, oh, are you coming to the Environment North thing? And I'm like, I have no idea what this is. Who are you? <laughs> it sounds interesting, but how did you get my email sort of thing? And they responded to that with, who are you sending email to us? And I tried to explain who I was, and I have, I have a lot of difficulty with that. And one of these days, I'm actually going to finish writing a bio. I've been trying to do it for like five plus years. I'm sure whatever I would have written five years ago is totally changed by now. But long story short, we figured we couldn't figure out how how they knew me or how I was connected to them. But I showed up, and it was this group of basically pro old protesters, old activists from the 1970s who must have been like in their early 20s, late teenage years in the 70s, and haven't gotten any new members practically since. Uh, it was a very, very gray crowd. Uh, but what they had done is they had brought in a speaker who used to be, I've got the notes here, the former commissioner of the environment, uh, if I've got that right, yeah, commissioner. And so the Ford government in Ontario fired her, basically without cause or anything like that, merely because she was doing her job, which was to be an advocate of the environment in the provincial government of Ontario. The environment doesn't vote, doesn't have ways of telling us what's going on. So, you know, who speaks for the trees? She spoke for the trees, at least in Ontario. And so she had produced these dozen or so lengthy reports, of which I picked up a couple. I should actually see if I can grab one quickly. Okay, so I guess I can't grab one quickly. I thought it was on the top there, but it's not. And so look, what these reports were, well, they were lengthy reports on topics relating to the environment in Ontario and the Ontario context. And so they would talk about, for example, the water situation in Ontario and w issues relating to clean water. One of the uh, it reports, possibly more than one, was on climate and climate change and how it impacts Ontario. And that was what she did her talk on. And her talk was just full of little details. Like she, I mean, she had notes, but she really knew this stuff cover to cover, front to back. She, she understood it at a very deep level and had all kinds of insight into the situation of climate change in Ontario. So for example, there are ways that you can get a minimum cost of climate change that has already actually impacted Ontario. And so, for example, uh, according to her at least, uh, she uh, said there was $1.3 billion of losses every year due to catastrophic storms. So this is just like, th this isn't even counting minor storms and the flooding is relating to minor, stor minor storms. This is like hail that is bigger than anything on record. Flooding that is bigger than anything on record in southern Ontario. Uh, fires caused by lightning storms that are bigger than anything on record. Th those sorts of things, right? This is just purely storms that are above the historical norm substantially. And that's a billion, over a billion dollars of damage per year that we're experiencing in Ontario. And then in public infrastructure, uh, so this is stuff like owned by the government that's being flooded, not from extreme storms, uh, just stuff that the government knows that it has to pay for because of climate. Things like uh, maybe air conditioner is not working, so they have to replace it, that sort of thing. That's $3.9 billion. So that's a total of just those two things, of $5.2 billion every year in Ontario. And so if they have some kind of remediation effort or a, a handling of climate change effort, things on the order of like 4 or $5 billion is it, it's like that's a year of cost. Now they're going to have to pay this year of cost every year anyway. But just to give some example of how big the the numbers are, so like keeping in mind, there, there's not that many people in Ontario. Like I I don't know the, the population off the top of my head, but uh, it can't be more than like 20 million people, right? Like Toronto is big, but it's not that big. So divide <laughs> five billion by 20 million, it's still a substantial chunk of change for the average Ontarian. So there's that. And 
so that I, I've just got like a, a couple of things that I wanted to kind of bring from my notes here. So, so one of the, the good things is that there's about 13, somewhere between 0 and 13 days per decade uh, increase in growing season. So that's about uh, maybe a half a day per year, plus or minus a little bit. So that's a positive impact that the growing season in uh, Ontario is, is, is lengthening. But it's also an observable one. So it's, it's one that you, even in the absence of other evidence, you can say, you can notice, you can see, oh, hey, we didn't used to have this long of a growing season, and now we do. So that kind of is uh, one thing to note of. The next thing was that she was at the original climate change research uh, and, I, I guess, international meetings in the early 90s, uh, when the probably when the IPCC was still like being <laughs> created sort of thing. And they pointed out that it was a threat to human civilization then, and they should have dealt with it then, and they didn't. So she just wanted to like highlight that we've known that how serious this is for a, as long as basically I've been, but it was just kicked down the, or kicked down the road because there was a lot of things that were emergencies, and there were a lot of things that seemed to be high priority. That the timeline of how serious this was just didn't seem to compare to. So. There's now we're in the situation where because we didn't act on it, the consequences get sort of greater and greater, and that's really unfortunate. To see. Uh, oh yeah, so 10% of Canadian properties are at high risk for insurance right now. So, or sorry, too high risk for insurance. Uh, so this this means that there's a lot of well, one in ten right uh, properties are at the point where they're just going to be uninsurable. And if the insurance companies haven't gotten around to just completely not giving them insurance, they're going to get there very, very soon. Like we're talking years, not like decades. And so, one, this means that people aren't going to be able to get loans to buy places because there will just be no insurance available. Uh, and then two, for the people who do have them, they're, they're really at risk. Uh, and they may not know that they're that much at risk because they may still think that, oh, I have house insurance, it's no big deal, uh, until suddenly they go to check and they don't. Having now seen how in insurance companies work in Ontario, it's, it's hard enough to trust that they're actually going to be there for you without something like this, right? So it's, it's, there's a lot of people who are in for a big surprise when in, in the course of the next decade or so something happens to them, and they're just going to be left high and dry by the insurance companies. And the, the provincial government knows this, the insurance companies know this, but it's not really clear that the people who are going to be screwed know this. So there's that. There's been three mass apple tree die-offs in the past three years. Corn in the United States is reaching a temperature ceiling. And if you know anything about, or if you've ever heard of uh, Swift on Security, uh, She's one of the probably best things on Twitter. Uh, she just goes on and on and on about corn. <laughs> it's, it's funny because she's usually, uh, it, her main topic is like computer security and IT, but every once in a while she'll just like talk about how utterly serious the situation of corn is to the United States economy and how it underlies literally everything. And yet here's this commissioner of the Ontario, uh, environment in Ontario talking about how we're the, the way corn is going to fail is corn is going to be fine until it hits a particular temperature and then it's just not going to be fine. And there's going to be very little, a, a really big cliff effect where once it hits that temperature, there's just going to be mass corn failures and the consequence of that is going to be uh, really harsh on the U.S. economy and probably the global economy as well. Now this was this this talk was done before uh, the flooding that I mentioned in one of the previous shows was coming that did in fact come to the the Corn Belt in the United States, and so there, as far as I understand, they're they're behind. Like the corn crop is going to be uh, not so good in the states. Uh, hard to say in Canada, but is this going to be the year that we start to see this this sort of thing failing? 
Hard to say, but it's coming, and it's coming relatively soon. So, what else we got here? Uh, there is, there, there are ways for cities in Ontario, and I guess by extension elsewhere, to take steps to reduce their, their impact. Uh, she mentioned Hamilton uh, is a using sewer waste, uh, she, I guess poop powered bus system. So instead of having buses powered by gasoline, it's actually powered by waste. And she pointed out there are four things that cities can do at a collective level uh, to kind of deal with this. The first is pricing. So things like daytime pricing, that the way that power is uh, priced in Thunder Bay. But not, not just that, uh, making it so that there's some kind of connection between the, the problems we're going to have with climate change and the amount of electricity people actually, and, and fossil fuels that people actually use. And then air, air must be air conditioning, and then heat, which is, is a serious thing uh, <laughs> out here in Saskatchewan during the winter. But heat, you can generate heat using things other than natural gas. It's just the way we've done it and done it cheaply for so long that it's hard to imagine these days that you could do it with something else. That, for example, the idea of a block heater, like people still go up, like Canadian Tire still sells block heaters. You can still buy just electric heaters for your house. They do nothing but take electricity and produce heat and nothing else. And yet we have all over the world now Bitcoin miners that are, are doing this essential function for this, this alternative to the financial system, and yet the heat for that, I don't think it's, it's really still, still being thought of as a source of heat, a way of generating heat cheaply, or in this case, not even cheaply, but like at, at a profit. And so should we be using natural gas or should we be actually just doing useful computational work to generate that heat? That's something we could be doing here. Maybe not even Bitcoin, just something else, right? Something else that we need computers to do that we need to be generating heat anyway somewhere in the world. We may as well do it in Saskatchewan during the winter because we need that heat anyway. And then the fourth thing is beef. And that beef in particular has just got this disproportional uh, impact on climate uh, from the methane. And it's worth considering starting to cut back on it. It, those those four things. If you get that far on the size of a city, that that's probably about as far as we can kind of throw right now. So it, it's worth thinking about. You know, if you go out for that burger, uh, just think about: it. Do you really need to eat a beef burger, or is a vegetarian option or a chicken burger enough? Like chicken burgers are pretty good. Unfortunately, burgers or beef tends to also be a pretty good source of iron. So I'm not really sure where <laughs> where to get iron other than that. Uh, but it, it, it's worth thinking about, right? So that, there's a couple other things going on that she kind of mentioned here. Right now it costs about 15 to 20 billion dollars a year to import fossil fuels into uh, Ontario. So a 30% cut in that, Ontario is basically better off for it. There, there's things like that where there's so much money being put into fossil fuels and fossil fuel in infrastructure right now that if you cut it, you, one, you save the money, but the, the saved money can be invested into alternatives and both at the government, company, and individual level, there, there are lots of win-win situations. And she went into a couple of them, that was kind of one of them, but it's not like every single thing is going to cost money, like the, the carbon tax, for example. If the carbon tax didn't have this other side benefit of allowing the money from the carbon tax to be invested in something else, right? If they just took the money from the carbon tax, you, you could at least say that, oh, hey, this is an expensive tax. And there's no upside other than just allocating resources if effectively, right? But there are situations like that in Ontario. Uh, let's see if I marked on any other of them. Uh, I don't think I did in my notes. But she had a good couple. So anyway, long story short, there are a couple. And her reports are will contain them. I wish I could find the link to them. I, I do have them downloaded, so when I find them, I'll try to post them where this is uh, posted. But there are win-win si situations still on the table, and a carbon tax is going to help find them. So, but unfortunately, the there were 
one of the things that the PCs did upon getting into power in Ontario is they cut a whole bunch of contracts with groups that were doing clean energy projects that were funded with the, the quota system that Ontario had uh, prior to the Ford government. And so this co caused, uh, there were 752 clean energy contracts of which a third of them had a significant indigenous uh, participation in them. So this is like pulling the rug under a huge number of businesses and in particular uh, First Nations groups that were relying on these, these jobs from these businesses and replacing it with, quote, innovation, which in her words is just another word for magic in this con. And ma basically, so it, it, if you hear someone talking about innovation as a means of solving a problem, it's just wishful thinking and magical thinking, at least in this context. So it was, a, it wasn't just those businesses losing that funding, but it was the stability of being able to count on the government for this kind of funding. So even if in the future someone other than the PCs gets elected in Ontario, no one's going to trust the Ontario government, at least to the extent, same extent, with their business. No one's going to believe when the government says they're going to pay you uh, and they're going to live and abide by their contract because they've just ripped up the contract. And whether it's labor contracts or these clean energy contracts, they, they seem to not be bound by contracts at all. And businesses need some kind of ability to get into contracts. This is what makes smart contracts so uh, effective and important, is it kind of removes some of the uncertainty involving whether or not those contracts will be fulfilled. And so this, this is going to have really long-term consequences on our ability to do stuff like deal with climate change when the PCs did this. So. In any case, this is starting to get to be a bit, about as long as I would have liked for this show. As usual, if you have any Creative Commons music or other free media that you'd like me to play, send it to me. I will give it a listen and maybe play it on the show. And if you'd like to mention anything or talk about anything on this show, also give me an email. Again, jeffrey.cliff at gmail.com, and we'll see what happens from there. So thank you for watching or listening. I will see you next week, hopefully with a guest.